Okay, so everyone still seems to be here, so that's great. I will kick us off for the final time. So uh, just so you all know, as I just said, the recording is now on. Um, so I don't know if you've been able to come to all of our seminars in the series or if you've been able to catch up with the recordings on YouTube, but this is the same introduction. I remain Alice M. Kelly, a literary and media scholar. I'm currently a fellow in residence at the Rothermere American Institute at the University of Oxford, who are funding this event. And I am really excited to welcome everyone to the last in the series. So same format as the last three seminars, there'll be a five minute introduction from me covering key terms, why I wanted to organize this series in the first place. And then I'll be passing over to our amazing speakers um, who are going to be doing two 15 minute presentations. Um, and then we'll have the Q&A. So feel free to, uh, if you have any questions or comments during the presentations to write those in the chat and you can either ask them at the end, uh, put your camera on and ask or I can ask them for you. Um, okay, so let's move on to our key terms. So again, I think this may well be very familiar to everybody here. But we are talking about transformative fandom and queer memory. Uh, and we're thinking about transformative fan works in terms of the artworks that fans create uh, using pre existing characters from copyrighted media. So often, transformative fan works are for shipping fandoms, where uh, it's fandom honoring a specific relationship. Um, fan works being about particular characters in a relationship. Um, and so I think we're all going to be talking today about my favourite subject, which is femme slash fandom, um, where it's female characters who uh, are in, depicted in a relationship in fan works, and those may be female characters who are presented as queer in source text or who are queered by fans in fan text. Uh, on screen, there's also um, other very popular forms of shipping fandom. And so, as I've said at the beginning of every other seminar in this series, we are looking at the online spaces where we find and consume and create and share these works. So, very briefly, to rehash the, the theory behind uh, this, this seminar series, uh, I really wanted to, I've been thinking about this sort of thing since I read Rogue Archives by Abigail the Cosmic, um, which I love and quote all the time in everything I do. Uh, and in Rogue Archives, the Cosmic really convincingly makes this argument that transformative fan works like fan fiction are um, tied to this question of memory because when we read or write fan fiction, that's what the Cosmic calls an act of remembrance because we're recording how we felt about, uh, about the, the text in question. And the Cosmic argues that the kinds of online spaces where all of these works can be found become aggregators of fan remembrance, huge collections of, of fan memory. The Cosmic also makes the point that um, online fan spaces are real queer spaces populated by people who identify across a broad range of genders and sexualities, which like all real queer spaces are rife with internal and external conflicts. So, so far in the series, um, we've been thinking about if transformative fan works are recording queerness, then who is included in these aggregators of fans remembrances, who are, who, is who are included in these archives. Uh, we've looked at how racialized limits affect the kinds of fandoms being memorialized. How does uh, the shape of archives except change the expressions and desires shared by fans of color as Mel Sanfil and KB and Powell talked about. We've also looked at um, the question of how 
how does fan-made queer memory relate to media produced queer memory or other forms of queer history, as Sarah Simwell and Emily Kocher talked about. Um, and we've been asking what types of embodiment are being remembered here? Are non binary people, disabled people being reflected in these spaces or the way that we as scholars talk about them as Dean Lethal and Marty Heath talked about last week? So today we're going to dig into the types of desires and feelings um, emotions, longings, and affects that these aggregators of fans remembrance document. I invited these speakers here today because of the incredible work that they've produced, which I'll link to in the chat. Um, and because around the same time I was reading Sia's uh, Transformative Works and Cultures article, where um, they talk about queer theorist and Svetkovich's work on the archives of feelings. Uh, and, and linking that to a whole host of online fan spaces. I was also talking to Veg Evangeline um, about how I keep losing my face. Um, about how she wanted to use Svetkovich's work to think about the archive of feelings that she has created um, on her absolutely fantastic website, Queer Interruptions. So I'm going to talk about my affects today. It's like 100 percent gratitude for these people. So, okay, um, I will now hand it over to Evangeline. So, there we go. Evangeline Aguas is a PhD candidate at the University of Technology, Sydney. With a background in film and television production, her interdisciplinary research aims to combine the fields of queer theory, digital media, and fan studies with creative practice. A current research project is an ethnographic study on how queer female and genderqueer fans experience queer temporalities, capturing abstraction, and lived experience through documentary form. Evangeline's research is supported by an Australian government research training program. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you, Alice, and thank you again for inviting me to participate in this fantastic seminar series. I'm really uh, excited to be here. Um, I'll just share my screen. Can everyone see a black screen? Great, let me just... Okay. So I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country. I acknowledge the Gadigal and Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation on whose ancestral lands I'm joining you from. And I acknowledge that First Nation sovereignty was never ceded. I pay respect to elders past and present, acknowledging them as the, as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this land. Uh, the title of my presentation today is Queer Interruptions, Disseminating Queer Ephemera and Melancholia in an Archive of Feelings. <clears throat> The material is drawn from my PhD research and the online documentary that I produced uh, titled Queer Interruptions. So just a brief overview of my, oops, sorry, just a brief outline of what I'll be covering today. Um, so I'll start with a quick overview of my PhD research on queer fans and temporality. And I'm doing a non-traditional PhD. Uh, which consists of a thesis and a creative component. So I'll be presenting the online documentary that I produced um, as part of my research. And I'll also show, show a short video from the work. Um, then I'll move on to a discussion on the documentary website as an archive of feelings and as an example of the fan archive impulse. And time permitting, I'll discuss the temporalities of digital media, uh, specifically digital archives and how they can reflect the backward uh, orientation and pastness of queer mel melancholia. So my research focuses on the queer female and genderqueer fans of the popular same-sex couple Clark and Lexa from the TV series The 100, also known as Clexa. So in March 2016, 
Lexa was suddenly killed, shot dead just minutes after finally consummating her relationship with Clark. Now, Lexa's death triggered intense backlash uh, from fans and mainstream media, with many accusing the show of employing the bury your gaze trope, also known as the dead lesbian syndrome, um, where queer female characters often meet violent, cruel ends, usually after experiencing a moment of happiness. Devastated fans also talked about the pain of witnessing yet another queer death on screen, with fan and writer Heather Hogan tweeting, straight TV writers will never understand how they can inflict time-traveling wounds that hurt us as scared gay children all over again. In this tweet, there is a sense of temporal dissonance. For Hogan, the pain of Lex's death paralleled the pain she felt as an adolescent watching the death of another queer character, Tara in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, 15 years earlier. For other fans, Lex's death triggered painful memories of coming out and of previous experiences with homophobia. So my research um, explores this sense of time traveling wounds and examines the fans' experiences in terms of temporality. So drawing on the queer theory, I discuss the multi-temporal experiences of Clexa fans and how they inhabit queer time. So how do they deviate from heteronormative life timelines and experience a sense of delay? How do their digital archive practices express the contradictions and ambivalences of nonlinear time? And how do they exhibit an anachronistic turn backward to linger in queer injury and melancholia? My presentation today focuses mainly on those last two points. So how archives collapse time and space by bringing the past into the present and how these queer Klexa fans linger in the painful memories of queer history. And as Heather Love argues, it's through lingering in these past injuries that we're able to map similarities between the queer past and the present. She writes, it is this intimacy between the suffering of the past and present that highlights the material and structural continuities between these two eras. So the multi-temporal experiences of fans reveal the porous boundaries between the past, present and future. And this temporal uh, emotional intimacy highlights how these painful histories are not cordoned off in the past but actually persist in the present. And this allows us to recognize the progress that's been made, but also recognize the inadequacies that persist. And you'll see that uh, these temporal movements between past and present are a recurrent theme in my presentation today. Now, I've explored nonlinear time and multiple temporalities in the design and content of my online documentary, Queer Interruptions. Uh, so I'll just bring up the website now. everyone see that? Okay. So the website homepage opens on an animated clock uh, with several hands moving out of sync, as well as explanatory text on the project's context and uh, navigation instructions. And in keeping with the nonlinear ethos of queer time, the website is laid out in a nonlinear fashion allowing you to navigate backwards, forwards, and laterally between videos. And the, the five short vignettes are laid out in a clockwise flow, uh, but they can be viewed in any order. Now the website background consists of the names of more than 200 uh, lesbian and bisexual female characters killed on television since 1976, which is an exhaustive list uh, compiled by queer online magazine Autostraddle. The website also features quotes uh, taken from respondents during online surveys. And I'd just also like to note that, <coughs> excuse me, my research um, adheres to my university's human research ethics guidelines and all participants were given uh, the option to use their legal names or a pseudonym. So I'll now present one of the videos uh, from the documentary. The whole video runs for 14 minutes, but I'll just show you the first three and a half minutes. Um, and just a content warning, uh, the video contains footage of a queer character being shot and a discussion of conversion therapy. So I'll just bring that up now.
Everyone see a black screen? Okay. Um, I'm just going to turn off my video and my microphone while the video is playing as well. I was aware that it was, I wasn't aware of the name of the trope. I was aware of barrier gays as a thing that happened to a lot of gay characters, but I didn't know it already had a name. I just recognized it kept happening. Like I said, I knew about it before the 100, um, that they kill off lesbians, that lesbians are either dead or crazy by the end of anything. I mean, the obvious connection to homophobia, even if it wasn't intentional, even if it wasn't in there, it's something that this trope, uh, that's what makes a trope a trope is that it gets repeated. It's not that anybody intentionally tries to be tropey. It just gets repeated over and over and over again until it's kind of just in the water. The hands of Skycrew's thief. She might even be angry enough to declare war! <laughs> I just remember just yelling out no and it just hit me so profoundly that at that moment I knew she wasn't going to live past that. I was so accustomed to queer death on television that I didn't, I didn't understand the uproar. I don't think I had the emotional reaction that a lot of people had or maybe I was just a nerd to it. Um, I turned immediately to the fan fiction. I was just like, fuck this, and started reading fan fiction, which is what we did with Xena, you know? I mean, you know, they killed her, they decapitated her, they, I mean, it was horrific. Um, and that was hor I mean, that was devastating to me. I think I just didn't let myself get attached that way again, if that makes any sense. Yeah. When your expectations are sub-basement, maybe it just is a little different. I felt personally like this was a dig. This was a like a, you know, into our community. And, you know, this is a result of homophobia that's been ingrained for years and years through this use of this trope. Yeah, I just, you know, kind of re experienced every homophobic thing that I'd ever experienced. And I had to kind of reprocess all the stuff with my parents. And I actually ended up going to therapy over the summer after uh, that because I, it was just like churning up all this stuff for me from the past that I kind of thought I had dealt with, but I really hadn't. Uh, it did bring up a lot of painful memories because my parents are homophobic. They're the nicest homophobes you'll ever meet, but they, they're very religious, they're Greek Orthodox, and they believe that same gender relationships are wrong. I went to conversion therapy, actually, and um, one of the things that the priest at conversion therapy said to me was, you know that you can't be happy in a lesbian relationship. You know they don't end well. You know they're not healthy, right? And that idea was literally articulated to me from a religious figure when I was only 16. And to see it play out on screen, to see the truth of that statement before my very eyes in a show that I thought was safe, to see a character that I related to so much die in such a convoluted and ridiculous way was, it was heartbreaking. It brought me back to that time when I was told I couldn't be happy. Uh, so please do check out the rest of that video and the other four videos on the website. Um, I'll just get back to the PowerPoint. So drawing on the work of Anne Svetkovich, I argue that the Queer Interruptions website is a queer archive of feelings, where it's a repository of the feelings, ephemera, and textures of queer lives. And Svetkovich uh, argues that these kinds of community grassroots archives fulfill the emotional need for history for queer communities who are often um, absent from institutional archives. Alexander Cho also explains that queer people have a troubled relationship with traditional archives that rely on visible and factual records, where often queer history can only manifest in what we usually consider secret, ephemeral, or even intuited or felt. So it was essential uh, that the creative component of my research incorporated 
uh, documentary video to capture this ephemerality, to capture the gestural and the inexplicable elements of emotional life. And again, Anne Svetkovich um, writes that documentary video is particularly adept at making visible the obscure and the fleeting. So Queer Interruption stands as a queer archive of feelings, a counter archive of the intangible and unorthodox, challenging conventional print archives and recentering queer histories from the margins. By preserving the fans' testimonials via our digital video and making it accessible um, via the internet, the website as archive has the ability to turn what seems like idiosyncratic feeling into historical experience. But this website also exists as part of a wider archival culture. Um, as Abigail de Kosnick writes, internet fan cultures are archival cultures. She goes on to say, their core operations concern the apprehension of media as archive, the unconstrained plundering of that archive, and the construction of both virtual archives and actual digital archives. So she explains that rather than a static and contained media archive, fans use mass media products as raw material to expand upon and manipulate. Fans then become active archivists, where the mass media archive is seen as open, capacious, permitting infinite withdrawals and welcoming of an infinite array of additional entrants and entries. So Queer Interruptions is not only a queer archive of feelings, but is also an example of this uh, fan archive culture. The website is easily distributed, um, instantaneous and interactive. So it diverges from conventional um, institutional archives characterized by delay. The project constitutes my own contribution to the mass media archive, but it also encourages the fan archive impulse. Uh, for example, Des, a 24-year-old queer Klexa fan from the US, shared her response to the website with me uh, via a private message on Tumblr. I do have consent to share this with everyone, by the way. Um, Des writes, I will admit I had to fast forward a little. I still to this day can't watch Lex's death scene. It triggers and sets me off. But I love being able to see people talk about their experiences. And I think this is so important. I've never made a YouTube video or video blog in my life, but I swear this is making me want to, just to participate and share those experiences in case it helps people. So the work compelled Des to further expand on the archive, both the mass media archive and my website as archive, and illustrates the productive potential of an unbounded and open fan archive practice. Alana Cumbia also describes how um, fans take on multiple roles as subcultural participants, archivists, activists, and documentarians, uh, writing that by empowering members of their subcultures and communities, to take on these roles, they create conditions for producing a diverse, inclusive historical record. So the website illustrates the participatory ethic of fan counter archive culture, recuperating the histories of not only marginalized queers, but also those of stigmatized fans on the periphery. And I think I'm running out of time. Uh, so I will just uh, briefly mention some talking points that I'm happy to elaborate further upon uh, in the Q&A. Um, so again, I mentioned earlier, archives uh, bring the past into the present and allow for temporal movements backward and forward. Uh, these are the same movements that I've identified in the fans' uh, experiences, which I've, identified, which I've identified as melancholia. I also talk about their experiences as a queer racialized melancholia, uh, where under dominant whiteness, the melancholia is unceasing. And some further points of discussion, um, how the porous boundaries between past and present are also reflected in the website design. Uh, so the background and the buttons and how the spatial configuration of an archive shapes the user's affective experience. So uh, how the layout of the website queers digital space and creates a sense of displacement or discomfort. Um, and I've drawn the work of Sarah Ahmed um, where she talks about the productive potential of this queer discomfort. So just to conclude, uh, as Amy Stone and Jamie Cantrell write, queer lives often marked by their ephemeral, non-linear and non-sequential nature 
are contained in archival spaces that are equally textured and complex. I argue that my website's melancholic confluence of time, um, its non-linear navigation and the transience of digital media culture point to the complex temporalities and textures inherent in the technology, content and a user experience of my website as archive. Thank you. Yay, thank you, Angeline. That was amazing. Very cool. Okay, so moving on to Snia Kumar. Uh, Snia is a PhD student in film and moving image studies at Concordia University. Their research interests lie at the intersections of fem slash fandoms, platforms, and feelings, particularly looking at how fan platforms often become sites for the archiving of queer feeling. They also have a vested interest in expanding the meanings of fan, fandom, and fan platform. In their dissertation, they aim to explore queer embodiments within the spaces, places, and expressions of transnational fem slash fandoms. Specifically, queer Indian women fandoms of the web, series, the web series. Their work has been published in the Journal of Transformative Works and Cultures and Render. You will often find them wearing some shade of blue. So, Snia, do you want to take it away? Yes, thanks, Alice. I'm uh, just going to share my screen and then you can tell me if you can see it. Yes? Yes. Okay. Moment. There it is. You just need to adjust it. Okay. Uh, so hi everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good night because time is weird and pretty queer. Uh, before I start, I just want to thank Alice for organizing the series and inviting me to present, uh, even though I feel like I know nothing. Uh, the work we do is important and fun, and I've learned so much from all the previous presenters. I also want to acknowledge that I live, work, and love on the unceded lands and waters of the Kanye and Gahaga Nation, and believe that land acknowledgements should be the first step toward reparations. Uh, so the title of my presentation is Bitten by Feelings, and it's based on uh, the uh, article that Alice uh, talked about. Um, and before I start, I just want to um, begin with a brief introduction to Kamala, uh, which is a contemporary adaptation of Joseph Sheridan Lefanu's novella of the same name and is a web series hosted on YouTube. Uh, the series was produced by Smoke Bomb Entertainment, Shaftesbury, and Ubi Cortex. And the plot follows human Laura Hollis, her vampire lover, Kamala Kahnstein, and their group of friends as they take on ancient gods a hostile university administration, and a host of other supernatural creatures. Um, so primarily referencing the work of Alexander Cho, Anne Svetkovich, and Teresa Brennan, I argue that Kamala fans use YouTube, Tumblr, and Archive of Our Own, or AO3, in a way that creates affinity spaces and archives of lesbian feeling. Cho defines affinity spaces as online social spaces in which people bond over shared interests. And in the Svetkovich imagination, archives of feeling are produced by queer performance that in turn produce publics. I propose, I propose that these three platforms become affinity spaces through Kamala fan interaction. And that fem slash fan fiction can be thought of as a kind of queer performance that creates community through the process of being written, read, and discussed. In many ways then, uh, platforms that host fem slash fan fiction, such as EO3, become archives of lesbian feeling by making such performances of queerness available to memory. Furthermore, these feelings take on an affective charge a la Brennan as they are transferred between fans and groups of fans. According to Brennan, affects are emotions that have an energetic dimension to them in that they enhance and deplete. Positive affects such as belonging enhance, whereas negative affects such as anger and anxiety deplete and identities are formed around the dumping of negative affects uh, onto marginalized groups, in this case, fans of color, usually black fans. Brennan calls this process of dumping othering. In exploring how exchanges of affect, as described by Brennan, determine the boundaries of the Kamala fandom as an affective femme slash community, I will simultaneously show how both positive and negative affects, such as belonging, happiness, nostalgia, isolation, and loneliness, respectively, travel across and through the platforms of YouTube, Tumblr, and AO3, as well as engage with the scholarship of Mel Stanford, Rukmini Pandey, Stitch, and Samira Natkarni, who argue that fandom continues to be structured by whiteness. Um, so Kamala's blog format uh, situates its characters and viewers within the affective economy of YouTube. 
Both Louise Ellen Stein and Laura Horak argue that this affective economy is determined by participation, interaction, and the sharing of supposedly authentic emotion. The formal qualities of the vlog, such as direct address, close framing, and a private setting, um, contribute to the interpre interpretation of expressed emotion as authentic. So as character Laura sits in her dorm room looking directly into camera while laying her life bare, uh, and referring to her audience as Silas University students, she invites the audience to enter into an intimate relationship with her and her Scooby gang. Camilla viewers are encouraged to react to Laura's actions because she performs her emotions as uncensored and sincere, resulting in fans giving her advice and sometimes even scolding her in the comment section. For example, a fan in support of Camilla's decision to break up with Laura writes, and I quote, nobody should tell you how to love them. You should show your love and affection how you want to. And if they try to tell you uh, how to do that, it's emotional manipulation. And that's got no place in a healthy relationship. You go, Carmela. This comment exemplifies uh, Friedler von Steenhäuser's argument that exposure to a character's thoughts, emotions, and memories encourage us to engage with the character self as real. And therefore, we react emotionally to their actions and also shows how Carmela fans bond with the series characters. The comment section also functions as an affinity space in which people come together not only over a shared interest in Camilla, but also a variety of other queer media, most commonly Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and thus also speaks to queer fanish patterns of consumption. So if, if affinity uh, in the Camilla fandom on YouTube is produced and structured by the form of the blog, the blurring of the real and the fictional, and discussions about the series as well as other interests in the comment section, then affinity on AO3 is a result of the ways in which Camilla fans align on the basis of a shared endeavor, that is the writing and reading of and commenting on fanfic. Olivia Riley shows how fan interaction is built into the very affordances of AO3, wherein every element from tagging to its filters are designed to allow fans to attribute meaning to fanfic outside of the main text. The affective charge of a fan work resides as much in social ties created by the exchange of narratives, the sharing of gossip and identity play. For example, on an alternate universe or AU fic that features Carmilla as a reclusive author and Laura as a photographer, there is a lot of discussion in the comments about, about how the author perfectly captures the tension in Laura and Carmilla's relationship, but questions their uh, decision to portray Laura as a character with obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD, particularly from fans who have been diagnosed with OCD or are in close relationships with people who have OCD. These conversations gesture toward life worlds that exist both in relationship to as well as beyond the text of the fic and also show how connections are forged as a result of these life worlds. Affinity on Tumblr travels and intensif intensifies primarily through the act of reblogging, which Troll theorizes is an act of repetition that results in the creation of community artifacts. Reblogging also queers time in favor of amplifying affect. For example, this beating heart meme uh, that you see about how cliffhangers at the end of an episode uh, has been circulated within the Camilla fandom on Tumblr multiple times over the past couple of years, particularly as more people discover the series. Furthermore, even the dis decision to reblog a post is submerged in affect and affinity, for one usually reblogs something that resonates with them. Reblogging also brings together multiple Tumblr users who have varied interests and identities into a community that hinges on shared love for a particular fan subject and or object. The ways in which Tumblr brings together fans of different experiences and diverse interests aligns with uh, Alexis Lothian, Christina Busa, and Robin Ann Reed's understanding of fanish spaces as ever expanding, enclosing multiple kinds of people and social relationships. These varied experiences and consequently varied affinities contribute to the non-linearity, incoherence, and impermanence of encounters on Tumblr. Resonance, repetition, and reblogging, the three R's, then become the ways in which Camilla fans on Tumblr trade in affect and form communities saturated with belonging and nostalgia. Um, so fem slash fan fiction on AO3, as well as AO3 itself, can be looked to for the ways in which they memorialize kinships between queer women and the kinds of feelings such kinships elicit. In many ways, both AO3 and fem slash fanfic function as digital archives of queer feeling, inspired by Svetkovich's argument that lesbian public cultures, in this case, queer female fan practices, take sexuality outside of the bedroom and orient conversations around kink and gender expression toward the collective. 
For example, in an explicit Camilla Ale fanfic in which Camilla is Laura's family gardener, a reader has commented, I think everyone is going to need a cold shower after that. Feel free to write as much of this as you like, smiley face. The response elicited in the reader by this fic is reminiscent of Linda Williams's argument that representing certain kinds of intense feelings, in this case, sexual pleasure, prompts the body of the viewer or the reader to respond in ways that mimic the feelings being depicted. Here, sex practices between two women become a source of pleasure through being shared. Another popular genre of fanfic within the Kamala fandom that makes queer feeling public is angst to the happy ending. So in a particularly angsty fanfic that uh, traces the demise of Kamala and Laura's relationship, a comment reads that quote, in both good and bad ways. Your writing is so amazing. You truly make me experience every emotion they do. It's so agonizing and I can't wait to read more. Here too, an exchange of affect is taking place. One that is painful and cathartic and ultimately leads to a kind of empathy. This is in keeping with Svetkovich's claim that public expressions of hurt and depression can lead to new forms of attachment. Also explored by Judith May, uh, Fatala and Elizabeth Woolidge in their work on her comfort fix. In making queer female forms of being visible and available to memory, AO3 acts much like a rogue archive. Defined by Abigail de Kosnick as online spaces that can be accessed by anyone without any institutional barriers, with content that can either be streamed or completely downloaded and wherein people can upload their work without fear of censorship. AO3 supposedly embodies all of these characteristics, even though I would argue that racism is a pretty large systemic barrier, but going back to the point at hand. Dikosnik also provides a lens through which to view fanfic itself as an archive, one that stores an image of the media objects that uh, they are based on. Therefore, fem slash fanfic can be considered an archival practice in two ways. One, by making queer female play public, and two, by preserving the cultural memory of the media works that, fa that fics have taken from and transformed. To paraphrase Svetkovich, Kamila's fem slash fandom on AO3 can best be described as a form of affective, erotic, and personal living that is public in the sense that it is accessible and sustained through uh, the collective activity between fans. And fem slash fanfic is a performative space that brings bodies together online and gives both writers and readers the opportunity to explore not only the potentialities of a fictional universe, but also of their own bodies, feelings, and identities. Uh, so three new characters of color were introduced in the plot uh, in season two of Carmilla. Mattie Belmont, who you see on screen, a black vampire antagonist. Mel, uh, a black human being who joins Carmilla and Laura's Scooby gang. And Theo, an Asian frat boy with a minor role. I will focus primarily on Mattie, whose origins can be traced to the novella. In the series, she is Carmilla's sister in the sense that they were both sired by the same vampire mother, the chair of the Silas University's board of directors, and ultimately a god after her murder. While in the novella, she makes a brief appearance as, and this is how she's described, quote, a hideous black woman with a sort of colored turban on her head, nodding derisively toward the ladies with dreaming eyes and large white eyeballs, and her teeth set as if in fury. She is portrayed as a beast in contrast to Camilla, who is a prim and proper countess of the night. When the white writer of the show, Jordan Hall, stumbled across Master's character, in the novella, she asked herself how the series could fix her treatment and representation. And so instead, Mattie is portrayed as deliciously campy in her decadence, in the luxurious and self-indulgent self sense, of course, at once threatening, but also deeply empathetic. Her murder, however, reflects an anxiety that is part of the everyday Black experience, being targeted and ultimately killed for being suspected of a crime. Mattie is murdered by Danny, a white self-righteous character who attacks her when the assumption that Mattie killed her uh, under the assumption that Mattie killed her sorority sisters. Danny is only aware of how to kill Mattie, which involves crushing a necklace she wears, because Laura broke Carmilla's trust and divulged the information to Danny. Here you can see how white support networks band together in the snuffing out of black life. The racial implications of Danny's murder of Mattie are almost completely ignored by the fandom whose three main groups seem to be those who ship Laura and Danny instead of Laura and Camilla, fans who are indifferent to character pairings but believe that Danny deserved better from the writers, and fans who ship Camilla and Laura but also love Danny. Danny apologists who have written full-length Tumblr posts explaining why she reacted appropriately or have supported Laura and Danny while simultaneously deriding Mattie by labeling her, and I quote, by, as, by labeling her uh, as, and I quote, violent, callous, and bigoted, 
claim that they have been victimized by the Kamala fandom and pushed to its periphery because of her portrayal as a bitch in fan work when she is in fact, and this is in the words of a fan, warm, loyal, giving, and a fighter. This accusation of bullying is leveled on the fandom in general, even though Danny has a pretty vocal fan community that vociferously defends her online, while Maddie is largely left out of online fan discourse slash practice. And those that do mention her in a positive light are either ignored or badgered. This shifting of positions from bully to the bullied, uh, often done by white fans in order to contain fans of color, has been explored in depth by the work of Rukuni Pandey, Stitch, and Samira Nadkarni. Additionally, the failure to even consider race in Kamala's queer fandom formations illustrates both Mel Stanfield's argument that denying structures of whiteness only serve to whiten the fan, as well as Brennan's process of othering, whereby judgment is projected onto marginalized communities. It is not Danny who is problematic, but Mattie and fans of color who, who fail to see her, Danny's worth. This dumping of negative affects onto specific fans then legitimizes certain affective connections with media objects over others. The interplay of positive and negative affects within the online Kamala fandom creates a fraught space that is both saturated with belonging and nostalgia, love, friendship and desire, and simultaneously violent, lonely, and isolating. So inclusion within an exclusion from fandom is more often than not determined by whether or not one's emotions align with the majority of the fandom. Shared investments in media objects are structured by power differentials that make themselves visible when, for example, fans of color bring the racism of fandom to the fore. The positive and negative affects of queer experience, performance, and being are not evenly distributed within fam slash fandom, resulting in an archive that stores only acceptable expressions of fan feeling and practice. Thank you. Oh, nice final slide. Thank you, that was absolutely <laughs> fantastic. I love that. I've written loads of questions. Uh, so